Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, Florida, the uh, first, first attempted colony in all of North America. Today we're de dealing with a continuing story of the great lumbering era which began in Pensacola and Northwest Florida about the year 1870 and for almost 50 years was the economic driving engine of all of the major things that happened to our community. In past episodes, we've talked about how lumbering began, how people with capital and skills and manpower came to Pensacola and opened mills so that by the time we were well into this era, by the, by the time we reached 1890, there were as many as 65 different mills, uh, large mills operating between here and uh, just north of Bruton, and the exports were, were coming well. The, the, the one little statistical figure that I'd like to give you here, the an idea was, uh, it, by the time we reached the end of the 19th century, in one year they were the, the, this port uh, shipped about 360 million feet of lumber in that single year. And that was, a, that was a tremendous amount of uh, cargo for that particular period, considering that we were shipping it all on small vessels that were of, of only a four to 500 cargo, to ton cargo capacity. So that's basically where we were. All right, the, we, we've talked in the past about what, what had begun to happen in downtown Pensacola. We need to, to talk a little bit about uh, the, some of the things that happened as a result in our port. Now, the port itself had been a, a, just a, a, a tiny little affair during the, uh, the Civil War period and thereafter. But once all of the lumbering activities began, that port, of course, took on a dramatic new tone. First of all, with all of the exports that we had, we had to have a, a whole new aspect here of the Federal Customs Service. And the customs officers came in, and they, of course, opened, off, uh, opened offices here, and they had to be, have to do all of the paperwork that was required for, for the ships as they came and they went. Then, of course, you had to have, you had to have the, the men who did the actual physical work. Now, there were probably as many as a thousand men uh, who were operating during this period, and on an, in an average year, uh, as longshoremen. These were the men that literally, uh, by physical force, took the, the uh, lumber, uh, co uh, converted lumber material off of barges or off the docks and literally put them on the ships. And these men were directed by what were called stevedores. The stevedores were, were literally organizing companies, and they worked generally with the steamship agents that we had mentioned at the close of the last session. So this, was a, this in itself was a very large uh, operation. By now you had a, a, a port director here, and the port director's job was to position these incoming ships, particularly those that, that had to be parked or anchored in the bay itself. And of course, he was the one that, that dealt with the pilots. Now at this point in time, every, well, even today, every vessel coming through the pass and again coming to a point of anchorage here in the, in the, uh, in the harbor was directed by a pilot who knew the, knew the direction, knew the, the, uh, the channel, and to, could take the vessel forward safely. Often the, uh, the vessel would come in here under its own sail, but sometimes uh, in a larger vessel or in, in adverse weather, they would also use the services of a tug and the the, the, uh, the uh, tugboat business here at this point in time became huge. Now, as all of this began, uh, we, we mustn't overlook the importance of railroads. We're going to do a separate episode a little bit later in our series on railroading, but we must mention, of course, that by the time we, middle, we come to the middle of the 1880s, railroading had become much, much larger. We had talked about the original line built from here to, to Flomaton Junction connecting with the LNN, and we had talked about the, the Pensacola and Perdido from downtown Pensacola to the Perdido Wharfs. All of that was fine, but by the time we reached the year 1881-82, the LNN and and its uh, other investors went forward with another line that would open up all sorts of things for lumbering. And that was, of course, the line, the company, the railroad line that became known as the Pensacola and Atlantic. It was built from Pensacola to the east, uh, a distance of 161 miles to the Chattahoochee River, where it would connect with another railroad company being built from Jacksonville to the west. This was completed then in 1882. And I mentioned it at this point in our story only because we want to remember that all of Northwest Florida, beyond the beyond Milton, uh, was packed practically vacant. There were there were no farms, there were no industry, no businesses, no no cities. So the op the building of that railroad literally opened up all of Panhandle, Florida, to traffic. And when you had a railroad, you could bring people and and materials back and forth. And that is exactly what happened in that period. Okay, now. Uh, 
the as as the story as the story proceeded and as the tone proceeded, we were moving into the 1880s, and you have to get a, a little different picture of what Pensacola must have been like. By the, by 1880, our population had topped 10,000. We were in a city that at that time had no water system, had no sewage system. This, of course, is pre uh, the era of electricity and natural gas. So Pensacola was a city that was literally without any utilities, and all of that changed. Pressured, of course, by the growth of this lumber, uh, uh, begun by this lumbering era, it began to change about the year 1884 and 85. And that year, by that year, uh, downtown Pensacola was having a, a, a terrible time with fire. All of the buildings here, of course, had been constructed of wood. They were, they were huddled close together. And we had only volunteer fire departments, very little work in fire prevention. And the, the serious fires downtown were becoming very, very, very uh, bothersome. Insurance rates were skyrocketing. And at that point in time, the only way the volunteer firemen could, uh, could fight a fire was with water that was kept in large barrels along the main streets of the city. The volunteer would come, they would put one end of their hose in the barrel, pump away, and the water would, would go on the fire. And everything worked fine until the barrel ran dry, and it frequently did. And so to help combat that, in 1884, a private water system was installed downtown. Well, as soon as that came, of course, yeah, the, basically the, the water system originally was supposed to be for fire hydrants, but quickly uh, when people in the homes and businesses saw that it was there, they wanted it in their residence or their, their business place, and so that was handled. And of course, if water goes in, some of it has to come back out. And consequently, the following year, 1885, the city of Pensacola finally got in the business of a running and building and running a sewer system, collecting sewage and piping it straight down into the bay without treatment. And that's the way it ran for quite a long time, but we'll be talking about that in another episode about utilities. Uh, beyond that, of course, you had, you had water, you had, utility, you had uh, sewage, and at this, almost exactly the same time we had something that allowed Pensacola to grow. Now up to this point, most of the city was below Gregory Street. Well, almost all of it, not, not quite all, but almost all of it. And uh, by now, by the time we get to the 1880s, a wonderful thing, of course, is happening. People have been making money, lots of money. Uh, we, not, we had, it was now, uh, people were sitting down in the, in the small houses they had occupied for years down in the lower end of the, of the city, and they were saying, we want, it. we want something nice. We, we got, may have all this money. We, we, what do we do with it? We, we can't buy a new Cadillac every year. They haven't started to make those yet. We can't get on an airliner and go to Europe. That's, that's, that can't be. Other travel is pretty difficult. We could, be, we could build a nice house. And so this is when the, the new, beginning 1881, 82, this is when the new housing development the new, uh, began. And this is when North Hill construction started. And this is, if you enjoy uh, in our time, going up and down the streets of Barcelona, Spring, and so forth, and what, looking at the beautiful old houses that were that are such show places today, they were constructed at this time using local materials and uh, using what they then called uh, uh, contract builders. We didn't have architects here to, to design them. Most of the families literally uh, did their own design work with the builder, and of course they were copying things that they got in uh, in ladies' magazines, which were already becoming a part of the culture of the country at that particular time. Well, uh, the, the the city began to to, to expand the uh, the uh, we, they, but as it went north, of course, people began to say, well, look, we, this is difficult. We can't, we can't get back and forth. How are we going to get back to go to work? How are we going to go to the stores? Well, the answer to that was, it came from uh, uh, the innovation uh, seen by a young man named Conrad Kupfrian. Kupfrian had been hired by a, a company here as a, as a bookkeeper, and uh, they sent him to St. Louis for additional training. He got there, got off the train, walked out of the Union Depot, and there right in front of him was something that had been around for quite a while, but Kupfrian had never seen. This was a horse-drawn omnibus or trolley or, or streetcar. And the light went on in his head, and he said, we have got to have that in Pensacola. So he came back. He found two willing partners named John Cosgrove and John Pfeiffer. They came up with a plan and the capital. They went to the city council, got a, a franchise agreement. And beginning in 1884, late 84, they put in place the beginnings of the streetcar system. And those streetcars initially ran from uh, uh, Main and Jefferson Street downtown, uh, north along Palafox, then east to the Union Depot. And after that, of course, the system was expanded both on the east side and on the west side, and a little bit more to the north, so that for the next, well, basically up to the year 1931, the streetcar was the main 
artery of transport for us here, when, no matter where you went or when you went there. It was a wonderful service, did a great job. It was taken over, I'm going to ahead of the story a little bit here, but it was taken over by the, uh, by the Gulf Power Company in 1926 when Gulf came into, into the area and bought the old electric company. And Gulf ran the streetcars for five years, but then when the depression struck and difficult, times were difficult, the streetcar system closed. And we'll come back to that, I hope, on another day. Well, now, going back to what else was being built downtown. In the middle of the 80s, the, the lumbering era was making life good for people. People were now having, we had more restaurants, we had, we had more uh, clothing stores, we had places where you can go like uh, like Trainer's Confectioner, where you could walk down the street uh, 12 hours a day and get a fine dish of ice cream and lovely candies. and Things were just becoming better, better as, as we went. Uh, now, one of the factors that, of course, was relatively new, brought in by the lumbering era, had begun here back in 1873. This was the creation by two men. Uh, one was Francis Brent, and the other was Louis Knowles. And these two men uh, put their savings together, and they opened a little storefront bank on South Palafox Street. This became known as the Brent Bank. And that was our only bank here until 1880. And in that year, two young brothers came here, Daniel and Martin Sullivan. They were from New York, and I don't know where their money originally came from, but they had lots of it. And they began what became known as the First National Bank of Pensacola. The Sullivan brothers rented a part of the old Santa Rosa House Hotel on the corner of, uh, of Jefferson and Government uh, as the place for their bank. And it was very successful. And then in 1882, they held, these boys, held a, they, the men held a press conference, and they announced that we are going to build a new bank. And everyone applauded, gently thought this was just, just so nice, the uh, success was theirs. And they said, it, it's going to be, we're going to tear down the hotel. The bank is going to occupy a corner of the new building, but the rest of the building, this huge building, is going to be an opera house. Well, people looked at the two Sullivan brothers and they said, well, that's nice. And then the, they, add, they added one more factor. The opera house will seat a thousand people. Well, now, Pensacola had about 11, 1,200 people, and not everyone, or excuse me, 11, 12,000 people, not everyone is going to be a culture lover. And so people looked around and thought, these, these boys have been out in the sun too long. This, this, they're, they're, they've lost it. But what the Sullivans knew and the others didn't was that up north in, in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, uh, what we would today call talent houses had been developed so that the opera house could arrange for a regular flow of wonderful talent coming here uh, all through the year, and that this would be something that the people with more money would want to spend their, their funds on. It would, it would build the culture of the area. And the opera house opened in 1885, and the Sullivans were absolutely right. People flowed in. They, they were able to get top flight talent, names that were stars up and down the coast and in, into the middle of the country. And of course, this, this developed a whole new industry because number one, this particularly appealed to the ladies because if they went to the if they were going to the uh, to the opera house to see something uh, featured tonight, they got all dressed up in a new new dress, a new hat, uh, high button shoes, beautiful fan, and there then they have tickets for Thursday night. Well. If they, they've had worn costume A on Tuesday, they couldn't possibly wear the same one on two nights later, so they had to have a new outfit and then another one perhaps for Saturday night. Well, the, the long and the short of it was the clothing business just absolutely mushroomed, as did the fine restaurant business, because after the show, of course, the people would want to go out, perhaps uh, have a dinner alongside the stars that had, they had seen perform. And so all of this came together as a feature that, number one, built culture, but also allowed people to enjoy the money that they had had been making. So the lumbering era, you see, was, was not only putting money in the bank and building new houses, it was also making a better style of life for all the folks who were here. The Sullivan brothers were extremely successful with their bank, and about seven years later, they and the Brents joined forces. They, they organized themselves together. We'll be talking about banking again in a, in a subsequent episode, but this became a number one bank in the city, and as that happened, of course, the, the business people said, we can't operate with just one, and so a, another bank was organized at the same time. And this was the beginning of the Citizens National Bank. So we'll be talking about that later. But as you can see, by the middle of the 1880s, Pensacola was arriving.